I am what he says I am. I have what he says I have. I can do what he says I can do. <clears throat> Tonight I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living seed of the word of God. I will never be the same. I shout it out, never, never, never. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Y'all don't get tired of that, do you? Amen. Well, I'm glad y'all are here. My throat's getting better. Hallelujah. So turn to John chapter 16, chapter 13. The Gospel of John chapter 13. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad all y'all are here. Thank God for the Sunday night crowd. Thank God for the Wednesday night crowd. I think we have more on Wednesday than we do on Sunday night. A lot of people come from other churches. And uh, we're just glad you come over here. All right, you found the Gospel of John yet? <clears throat> Let's read, uh, starting with verse 3. Jesus, knowing that, that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from the supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Girded himself. <clears throat> After that he had poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said unto him, Lord, you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do now, what I do, you know it's not, but you shall know hereafter. Peter said unto him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered and said unto him, If I wash thee not, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said unto him, <clears throat> He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but he is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, he, he, he had taken his garment and was set down again. And he said unto them, know you what I have done unto you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then be your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given unto you an example that you should do as I have done. Could I have an amen? amen. You know, there's a lot of truth in that portion of Scripture that I've just read you. It's not the fact that... Uh, we ought to physically wash one another's feet. That was the custom over there. They wore sandals. They were in a land where they walked. And uh, when you came into a home, you uh, showed a courtesy by washing their feet or giving them an opportunity to wash their feet. I remember years ago, though, something that touched me. <clears throat> After I received the baptism in the Holy Ghost down at Hibbert Memorial Baptist Church right down the street, uh, I didn't tell them that I had uh, received the baptism because I knew they'd drop dead and I didn't know how to raise them yet. <clears throat> but we had been praying and praying in a deacon's prayer meeting, our men's prayer meeting, not just deacons. And, uh, you know, uh, we were praying for revival. And uh, when God sent it, a lot of them didn't like it. Everybody say, God bless the Baptist. You know, it's a new day today. Not near as much opposition. 
But uh, Brother Bell, Curtis Bell, especially was close uh, to me, and, and he really had a deep desire for God's power. And um, so the first Sunday I preached after I got the baptism. I didn't say anything about the baptism. But I'll tell you, I didn't have any introduction, three points, and a poem. I just preached Jesus, and there was no conclusion. I just quit. Because I'm telling you, with the Holy Ghost, you can preach. And a little old wooden church down there, we built that new one down there, but there was a wooden church then. And I go, go out the side door. Brother Bell ran out the back door, came around the building, and stopped me as right as I was stepping out of the building. He said, you got it. <laughs> he said, you got it. I know you got it. Whatever you've been praying for, you got it. Well, you know, I, I like to never got the baptism. I mean, there was no charismatics, nobody to help us. I was afraid of the Pentecostals. They were afraid of me. And I just had to do my own hunting. And th I was thirsty and I, I had a time. I mean, I, I months and months I saw God. And I was tired. Brother Bell said, you got it. I said, he said, help me get it. I said, get it yourself, I'm tired. I'm not going through this with you, Curtis. <laughs> and so Brother Bell, he started uh, searching himself. And he, he got off someplace, some man that knew, had the Holy Ghost. And, and about midnight one night, I was sound asleep. And, and my doorbell rang. And I went there in my robe. And there stood Brother Bell <laughs> with a can of Sanka coffee under one arm and a bunch of cookies under the other. <laughs> I said, Curtis, what in the world are you doing here at midnight? He said, get up. I got the Holy Ghost and we're going to have a party. <laughs> now, now all Christians have the Holy Ghost. Everybody born again has the Holy Ghost. But there is an anointing of power. And uh, we've been taught in college and seminaries and preachers do the same thing as they come out of there that we get it all when we get saved. But that's not true because there's anointing for power after we get saved. Well, I said all that to say this. Years later, before Brother Bell went to heaven, he said, come out to the, uh, come out to the prayer room. And I went out there. He had a pan. And he said, take, let me take your shoes off. And uh, he washed my feet. And he wept. And he said, Brother Osteen, I'm washing your feet to thank you that you didn't get the Holy Ghost and run off without telling us. Thank God you stayed in the church long enough to know, let us know there was power from on high for everybody who desired it. And that touched me. So in that sense, sometimes we may want to wash somebody's feet. But you know, this is symbolic of hum humility, of service. We ought to have a, a spirit of humility, willing to take the place of a servant. You see, Jesus, the Lord of glory, had laid aside all of his royal power and become a child and was born into the world. And now, you see, there are three reasons I'm going to give you tonight, and then I'm going to preach about something else in that chapter, why Jesus washed their feet. Number one, he said Jesus washed their feet because he is ready now to depart out of this world and go back to the Father. Jesus, knowing that he came forth from the Father into the world and that he was leaving the world to go back to the Father. He wanted to take the place, the job of a servant and laid aside his garments and took a, a towel, girded himself and just got down on his knees and began to wash their feet. It's one of the last things he ever did before he went to the cross. And, you know, we ought to have a spirit of humility like that. The 
reason Peter got so excited about Jesus washing his feet. You see, uh, he knew he was the Lord of glory. You will never wash my feet. See? But Jesus, knowing he wanted to leave an example of humility, the fact that he's, even though he's the son of the living God, he's not above washing their feet. And we ought not to be unwilling, you know, to do the little things that will bless people. You know, Dodie sort of cried this morning. She said, when Lisa preached, we, did, you, did you watch Lisa this morning? She's good. Hallelujah. Amen. She's good. And Dodie said, darling, she said, I wish I could teach like Lisa. I wish I could teach like Glory Copeland. She said, it just seems like I, I can't teach. I said, Dodie, I said, you have the most marvelous ministry of compassion and love for people. They're looking at you saying, I wish I could have what Dodie has. Amen. Amen. A special ministry. I don't know of anybody in the world that has that ministry. How many of you have ever cried when you ministered, reading letters and all that? <laughs> I had to get the handkerchief out. Box up. We ought to furnish Kleenex during her part of the service. <laughs> but you know, he, he, knowing that he came from God and going back to God, he, he, he made this one of the last things he ever did. Don't you know they would never forget it? Secondly, Jesus, it says there in the scripture, having loved the disciples, he loved them unto the end. He wanted to show his love at the end of his ministry. His love was, was continuous. He guarded his disciples. He loved his disciples. He was committed to take care of his disciples. And he wanted them to know he loved them so much that he would just kneel down and wash their feet. You know, if we love God and love people, we ought to show it. You know, there was a man and woman been married about 35 years and she complained to him. She said, you never tell me you love me. He said, I do. She said, when? He said, what day we got married, I told you. <laughs> and I meant it. But it's one thing to say you love somebody, you got to show it. You got to say it. Could I have an amen? amen? So he showed his love to the very end. And uh, the third thing is that he wanted to show them that the Lord of glory was willing to stoop down like a servant and be a servant unto them just before he went to that cross. He said, you call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for I am. He said, then, if I have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Now, by washing feet, I mean doing those little things that make people happy. See what a tremendous ministry Dodie has. Little letters. Little thoughtfulness. Little recognition of families like Ken and Jeannie back there who just got married. Just, think, just little things to lift people. You know your words can lift. Your actions can lift. You say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to submit myself to that. I, I'm somebody come. The Bible says, let no man or woman think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Amen. Well, you say, I'm some. Listen, without Jesus, you're a big zero. Yes, you know, it was a little thing, but big to me. But I was flying up to speak at Carlton's minister's meeting, and Ed Montgomery called me and said, I, you, you going to go up there? I said, yes. He said, you going alone? I said, yes. He said, I want to go and take care of you. 
He's a pastor over here, a black pastor. And he met me there. He carried my suitcase. He took care of me. I'm telling you, I, I didn't have a worry in the world. But he was washing my feet. Amen. And uh, we had a lady when I had so much trouble here with my feet. She said, right, Pastor, can I do something for you? I said, what's that? She said, I want to come and give you a massage on your feet. She came right in the office over here, and I took my shoes off, and she just rubbed my feet and rubbed my feet and pulled my toes. <laughs> it felt so good. So good. Did you ever have one of those? Get her to do it. It cost $25, I think. <laughs> but she gave me that. That was washing my feet. See? And little things. Well, you know, Peter said, uh, you shall never wash my feet. And he said, if I don't wash you, you'll have no part with me. Boy, he, he got excited. He said, wash these big old fishermen feet. Wash these big old fishermen hands. And here's my head, just wash it too. I want to be a part of everything you're doing, Jesus. And then... Jesus said, what I'm doing now, you don't understand it, but you shall understand it hereafter. Listen, there's a lot of things going on in your life, in your life, you don't understand now, but you will understand later. Hey, y'all want a drink? <laughs> but here's the scripture that I want to talk about a little bit. Look at verse 10. Jesus said unto him, He that is washed, now this is kind of a contradiction. Jesus said, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but he is clean every whit. Now, I want to talk about that a minute. There are two Greek words there. The first word, he that is washed, means bathed, like you take a bath. And uh, the other Greek word for wash is to actually wash, not take a bath. And Jesus said, you know, you all took a bath this morning. But while you were walking over here and going down through the daytime before you got over here at night, your feet got dirty, you got travel stains. to be bathed again all you need is for me to get the travel stains off of you and you know we are washed in the blood of Jesus aren't you glad the book of Revelation says unto him that loved us and washed us and made us everybody say he loved us he washed us and he made us. Thank God. He washed us in his blood. And made us white as snow. Doesn't matter what you've done. When you come to Jesus, there's no record of it anymore. So he bathed us in his powerful mercy and goodness and grace and his blood. And once you get bathed like that and get born again like that, you need help once in a while, but as you walk from day to night and go through this dirty, worldly place, you get travel stains. You start out in the morning singing. By the night time, you got dirt here and dirt there, and you've made a lot of mistakes. Anybody ever go a whole day without making one mistake? <laughs> so we need to be careful to daily get the travel stains off of our life. You know what I'm talking about? You know, you start out. And you're just as happy as you can be. And somebody cuts in front of your automobile. And your ears begin to burn. And your mind is thinking, if I could just get a hold of him. You say, I never do anything like that. Then you go on. And you get aggravated and have a sharp word here. 
or you yield to temptation. And by the end of the day, you know, you've got travel stains. Got to have an amen. amen. Anybody ever have any travel stains? You don't need to get born again, again. All you need to do is to dip your feet. See, the Bible says that we ought to, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, the book of uh, Galatians says, it says, uh, if a man be overtaken in a fault. Lots of Christians are overcoming a fault. Anybody here since you got saved have never committed one sin? Stand up and we'll put you on the top of the list for liars prayer. <laughs> if a man be overtaken in a, in a fault or a sin, you which are spiritual, restore such a one. We ought to help people get rid of travel stains. Well, how do we, how do we get rid of travel stains? You know, if you'll read your Bible every day, that'll help you. The Bible says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto according to your word? It says Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it and cleansed it by the washing of the water in the word. He said now you are clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. Do you know if you go to bed with travel stains you won't get your sheets dirty but you won't sleep. The Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Many a time, I sped along the highway, racing to get home before the sun went down. <laughs> and I said, Dodie, you haven't repented yet. If you have committed sin, if you have yielded to temptation, if you have spoken an unkind word, if you have cheated somebody, if you have not told the truth and been honest with people, if you have done wrong in the sight of God and hurt people along the way, don't let the sun go down on your dirty feet. You understand what I'm talking about? Let every sunset be a time of getting things right. Every time that sun sets, you ought to have everything right between you and anybody else in the world. Call them, say I was wrong. Get to them in person and say, forgive me. Ask God to forgive you. You don't need to get born again. You just need to get rid of travel stains. And the sun has already gone down. But before you hop in bed, get all those stains off. Get everything right between you and God. See, and if you'll walk humbly and submit yourself to people, be a quick repenter. Be quick to recognize your sin. Be quick to, to have a tender conscience. Don't, uh, don't fail to listen to that inner voice. You, you, you take an alarm clock. You first hear that thing in the morning. It's, a, it's the first one you ever had. It'll jar you to high heaven. You wake up and where, where am I? Where am I? But you know if you make yourself sleep through it, again and again and again, soon 
you won't even hear it. You're so used to it. And your conscience is, is your alarm. Alarming you. You have done wrong. You have done wrong. But if you override that conscience and keep on doing the things, pushing them down, burying them, ignoring them, trying to get away with things, and you'll soon get a seared conscience. And nothing will seem to bother you anymore. You'll be able to say, well, I, I can live any way I want to. Talk like I want to. Nothing seems to bother me. I want to have a tender conscience. If I ever do anything wrong in the office, sometimes I get excited. You know, I'm not uh, perfect, just 99%. Thank you for your enthusiasm over that. But, you know, I never, I, the, the, anybody, anytime I speak out of turn, or maybe I am wrong, I always make it up before I leave. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to let anything. I, I, I'm quick to say, hey, I was wrong. Forgive me. I'd rather do that than to roll and toss all night and have to do it the next day. Amen. And you know, you and your wife, ever have any sharp words? One husband said, mine have to be sharp. My, I can't get in word edgewise. One person said they lived together 50 years and never had a crossword. Oh, God. I've been there 39 years. And I'll tell you, we've had three or four. <laughs> but you know, husbands and wives get, get crosswise. <laughs> Did you ever go to bed and turn your back and pout? You men, I can tell, men are the biggest powders in the world. Yeah, powder. You know, I, many times I've tried to sleep. But you can't sleep. And let me tell you something, you're going to eventually make up. You will eventually make up because you are stuck. You are stuck with that woman. You are stuck with that man. And those travel stains and words and attitudes. Why be sleepless two or three nights? Why don't you just give up? And forgive her. And forgive each other. In your sleep. Jesus said, don't let the sun go down with travel stains on your life. Make it right with God. Make it right with people. Keep a clear, tender conscience. Live a life of humility like Jesus talked about. You are not the servant, he said, is not greater than his Lord. If I've humbled myself, and washed their feet and showed love to them as the Lord of glory I've set you an example that you go and do likewise not only to your family but to all those you contact in the world and you know if we'll do that wash one another's feet do little things for people and this congregation I guess is the best congregation in the world to do things for people I mean, if, if we have a need, 25 people be down here trying to meet that need right now. I mean, this congregation is trained to walk in humility. So if we're going to be like Jesus, the Bible says, submit yourself one to another. Be clothed with humility because God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the lowly. That's the reason I always tell you where I came from, who I am, lest you get an exalted attitude toward me and Dodi and our family. I know where I came from. I know what I am without Jesus. I know where he found me. Thank God. It's good to walk knowing that you can't do nothing 
without Jesus, but with him you can do all things. Amen. So let's walk. And let's get our travel stains cleared. And rise up every morning with a new start. A cheery smile. And a desire to serve and help people. In Jesus' name. Amen. Is that all right? Amen.